It, it is concerning what's going on in the world right now. So we're seeing tensions escalate. Is this really a threat? Russia has said that it may in fact be forced to deploy intermediate range nuclear missiles. What do you think the likelihood of an actual nuclear threat is? Well, in our lifetime, I think it's very likely. U.S. troops readying to go to Europe 8500 on heightened alert. Personally, I feel like I'm always kind of at DEFCON 2 in the sense that I'm always ready to deploy my resources if needed to get out of Dodge. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today on the channel, we have a special guest. We have Roman and I'm probably going to mispronounce the last name, but if I get it right, you have to send me your, your most expensive product. Okay. I'm going to give this a crack. Roman. Do, go ahead. Roman Zarzewski. How did I do? That was wrong. That was wrong. Oh. But, but close enough. I've, I've heard much worse from gym teachers growing up. So the way it's Wait. pronounced is Zarzewski. It's uh, Eastern European, Polish, Russian. So yeah, it's Zarzewski. Zarzewski. Okay. I just learned something. Close enough. That's very close. If you said it like that the first time, I would have definitely sent you a nice gift. Oh, damn. Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Matt, it's great to have you on. And, and for any of you guys who don't know uh, Roman, you might have seen him on some YouTube channels before. You may be familiar with Mira Safety Gear. Uh, it's quickly becoming one of the most flourishing uh, personal protective safety companies that I'm aware of. So we're just going to shoot the breeze today. We're going to talk all about uh, prepping stuff, uh, about the nature of some of the things that are going on in the world right now, and what sort of personal protective equipment is really required. Is the, the need for gas masks and hazmat suits, is that a little overblown in the prepping community? Or is it something that you should need? Where should it be prioritized in terms of the stuff that you're going to purchase? Now, Roman's in a very unique position because you're a dual citizen, Russian American. And so I'm really interested in, in knowing your take on the state of global affairs and maybe just uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and, and your company. And then we'll get into the, the meat and potatoes of our conversation. How about that? Sure. That sounds good. Um, so I was born in the 1980s, right around the time of Chernobyl. And um, that was actually one of the reasons why I created Mirror Safety, one of my kind of motivators, because uh, while my family wasn't directly impacted by it, you know, my family was on the ground. It was always discussed in family circles on what could have been done to prepare, to mitigate the situation, to prevent it, um, to kind of help save more people. Because, you know, you don't hear about it in the news too often, but there are many people living in the exclusion zone that have really horrible health conditions because they grew up in an irradiated area. And some people are still living there even after, you know, the exclusion zone was put up and people were told to leave. Uh, many people refuse to leave their belongings behind, their lives behind, and their homes behind. Um, so, uh, that was one of the reasons I created Mirror Safety. Another one was, uh, you know, I moved to the U.S. when I was six years old uh, in the 90s, right during the collapse of the Soviet Union, grew up in New York City. And then in uh, 2001, I was in Brooklyn in high school when the towers came down and my buddies and I kind of watched that whole thing unfold. So that was another motivating factor, something that always stuck with me, um, you know, witnessing that and realizing that if on that day, people had something so simple as, you know, a half face respirator, we wouldn't have seen so many cases of mesothelioma, 9-11 syndrome, as they call it, and all these other horrible, debilitating diseases that develop from that. So, you know, it always stuck with me that uh, respiratory protection is vital for survival. Very interesting. Very interesting that you've had so many experiences and that you were so close to, to these disasters in two different countries, which were, of course, superpowers in their own right at the times. And I agree with you 100% about uh, the, the importance of having some sort of uh, respiration equipment, because, you know, we talk about the three second rule, three seconds without air, three days without water, three weeks off without food. And there's a mm -hmm. little bit of leeway with the three days without water, three weeks without food, but there really isn't a lot of leeway with three minutes without air. 
So as much as these might be lower probability events, when you need personal protective equipment, you really need it. Like it's the only thing you need. Okay. One of my greatest motivational quotes is when you want something as bad as you want to breathe, you will get it. And so it just, you know, speaks to the importance of uh, having some sort of personal protective equipment. Now where that ranks in a person's preparedness hierarchy, uh, should they just run out and start getting this stuff right away? I don't necessarily think so, but we'll talk about that in a minute, but I'm a little more interested in learning about, you know, your perspectives on what's going on in the world right now. Cause we're seeing tensions escalate. It's hard to parse out what's just theatrics. Uh, what's saber rattling? Is this really a threat? What is your opinion of the situation and what are you doing uh, preparedness wise to take steps for whatever the outcome might be? I mean, you know, guys like you and I are in a very unique position to prepare in ways that most people can't prepare considering, you know, we run companies in the industry we have access to a lot of equipment, um, but you know the, it, it is concerning what's going on in the world right now. Um, I, I'm the kind of person that likes to hope, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and um, you know that's always been my philosophy in preparedness. So if you prepare for you know a nuclear attack or zombies, which are kind of like the most extreme versions, and, and you know the reason I say zombies is because it's so you know such a deep part of kind of pop culture. The worst case scenario really is kind of a zombie outbreak, so to speak, or a nuclear attack. So if you prepare for that, you prepare for many type, uh, many different scenarios. Uh, as far as how viable the threat is, um, you know, I'm not really qualified to speak on that. I don't know. Um, I just know that I'm doing everything I can to protect myself and my family. Um, and I do listen to information from both sides of the aisle, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to speak Russian and be able to write in Russian and read in Russian. So I'm listening, you know, I listen to Russian news and, you know, I, I analyze it. I watch it every day just to see what the other side of the aisle is, what Russian state sponsored television saying. And it's deeply concerning uh, because, you know, a, a lot of the rhetoric on the Russian side is really uh, 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 sells the idea of retaliation as, as uh, you know, and, and some, uh, as more of a defensive measure, right? It, it's always Russian state news is always talking about defending itself, not nothing about offensive. It's right. all about, hey, we're being encroached on by NATO, we're being encroached on by the US. They, you know, they constantly release stories of American intervention and meddling in Ukrainian affairs and Russian affairs, and even in our own affairs you know, with the elections and everything. And, you know, there, there are many, you know, types, uh, there's many conspiracy theories out there, and a lot of alternative uh, news sources, and some of them are credible, right? Certain things, you do have to kind of raise your eye and kind of, you know, put on your thinking hat and, and think, hey, this doesn't look right. But, you know, you have to realize that it's, that it also serves as Russian propaganda, or the propaganda of our enemies to, to use um, any type of irregularity in what we're doing against us to polarize the Russian people and also potentially polarize Americans, right? Because a lot of Americans, you know, you know, there's, there's also a level of information that's coming into the U.S. from these sources. And you might not realize that it's some sort of propaganda machine, but it is. You may just think, hey, it's, you know, it's an alternative news source, but it may also double as propaganda from the opposite side. Uh, so it, it is deeply concerning. Um, the news on Russian television, it seems to, uh, over the last month or so, has intensified the rhetoric um, and, you know, uh, kind of selling a possible intervention to the people of Russia, because Russia wouldn't want a situation where they take some kind of action and it's not supported by the people. In order to make it supported by the people, it's a media machine. It works the same on both sides, in my opinion. It works the same for the Russians and the Americans. Absolutely. You know, when it comes to selling a war, they sell it on TV with the media. So um, it, it's deeply concerning. Yeah, and I agree with you 100% that it certainly works, works both ways. And any country is going to all, always 
try to present themselves as being the defenders or, or the victims, right? It doesn't matter what side of any conflict you're on, because they know that the majority of people aren't going to support an incursion into another person's or a country's territory unless there was a legitimate uh, threat against people. Because people by nature, you know, don't want war, obviously. It costs a lot of money. There's a lot of unnecessary casualties and bloodshed. So to sell that to a population, there has to be a threat. And you could say that both sides are playing that game. So it's very hard to parse out what's what. And I usually just go by, okay, what are the, what are the actions being taken? Because it's very hard to, it, it's very hard to discern what the motives are and what's going to happen next. You can only really judge the situation in terms of where the, the playing pieces are being moved on the board. So what we see right now is we see a, a lot of more aggressive saber rattling in the sense that they're moving troops here and there. And for me, that's a pretty big red flag when you're starting to have uh, diplomats leaving certain countries and uh, you know embassies being vacated in spite of whatever is said in the media, because we can't really go on that because we know that there's always going to be crowd control and damage control. So myself as a prepper, I'm always trying to stay alert, trying to stay prepared because you just never know. You can't really uh, confide in, in the media to really give you the uncut truth. It's very hard to find. Uh, so I, I just try to take the approach of, I, if I could speak Russian, that would be amazing because then I could really be analytical with this. But in terms of like your own personal DEFCON level, if you will, you know, right now, I, I believe we're still at DEFCON 4. They haven't brought us to DEFCON 3. We haven't been at DEFCON 2 since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think that's the highest uh, in terms of nuclear tension that we've ever been. Where do you see us right now? Where do you, what's your personal DEFCON level with all of this? Is this something that you're really concerned about or is it just something that's in the back burner right now? Uh, personally, I feel like I'm always kind of at DEFCON 2 in, in the sense that I'm always ready to deploy my resources if needed to get out of Dodge. Uh, so I'm, I'm always at the ready. Am I doing anything extra considering what's going on? Uh, a little, you know, I'm, I'm looking through my kit, double checking everything, making sure that all my filters are in date. Uh, making sure that uh, uh, basically my, my kid is well stocked. There's nothing I forgot. I mean, I did have an addition to the family not long ago. I have a five month old baby now. When you have a baby, kind of other preparation things come into mind, more gear that you have to get. Um, you know, it, it, it complicates things. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I would say I'm always at the ready with having a way to evacuate if needed and also having a way to hunker down for an extended period of time with food and water. So what do you think, like if we just get down to brass taxes, what do you think the likelihood of an actual nuclear threat is? I mean, let's just jump right to that because obviously, you know, a full on nuclear exchange is, is something we hope would never happen, but there, there's always the possibility of an accident or a cyber attack or maybe a nuclear power plant being taken offline or, or something like that, or maybe some terrorist organization that does something or something is, you know, uh, attributed to. So what do you think that the actual likelihood of us getting to a true DEFCON 2 or 1 situation is within our lifetime? Just as a person of, you know, dual citizenship, you know, well, in our lifetime, I think it's very likely um, because, you know, I'm a follower of Murphy's Law. Anything bad that can happen will happen eventually. Um, in our lifetime, uh, I'm 90% confident that something, uh, nuclear weapons will be used in our lifetime uh, against the country. Uh, whether it will happen now, I think it's, I think it's very unlikely likely uh just because in order for it to get to that i think uh, a bunch of mini skirmishes have to happen before you know that that's the ultimate form of destruction and once you press that button there's no going back and i'm pretty confident that both putin and biden know that right you like pushing that button is the end of the world so if you push it 
you're basically destroying hundreds of millions, if not billions of lives with a, with a, you know, a single button, or I don't, I don't know how many buttons they have. I'm sure it's a few buttons, but <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an apocalyptic scenario. So I, I don't think it's very likely in the near future. I think it, the likelihood would go up if there was already a skirmish that happened, right? If let's say you, uh, Russia actually stepped into the Ukraine and then Western forces had to deploy their troops there. And there was an active kind of proxy war of sorts between the West and Russia through Ukraine by supplying them weapons. Um, it could raise the likelihood, but I think we're several uh, dozen chest moves away from that. The, the chess board has not been set up right now, in my opinion, for that to happen. However, you know, you never know. Um, and I always prepare once again, hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. And good thing is a lot of the most essential preparations aren't out of reach for, I would say, 90% of the people watching your channel. It's really just food, water, even a basic you know, half face mask. So you're not breathing in particulates. If there is some kind of fallout scenario, you're not breathing in uh, irradiated particulates uh, and having a place to go. I mean, those are, those are really the basics. And, and I think you cover the basics quite well on your channel. And once again, 95% of your listeners are probably going to be able to cover those things. Yeah. I would have to agree with you. I, I like your, your chess analogy in terms of us being many moves from that point. Uh, the only thing I would add to that would be that I think once those things get in motion, it could, it could probably escalate quicker than we anticipate. And there's always this looming threat of a winnable nuclear war, right? The whole first strike advantage. And I think, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's China or the United States or Russia who are experimenting with hypersonic technologies and different ways that they can uh, circumvent missile defense systems in ways that you could essentially win a war and avert a mutually assured destruction scenario. And for me, that would be one of the most catastrophic uh, scenarios because you have a situation by which if you can neutralize a country's ability to retaliate, then you could effectively win a nuclear war, inflict minimal uh, damage on the opposing country's civilian populations. At least this is the theory. Now, is the technology exist? Does, does Russia have that? Does the US have that? I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows because, of course, we only know what we're, we're told and what is. And that's why I kind of laugh when I when I hear uh, estimates of nuclear stockpiles and stuff, it's like, come on, like, are they, you know, we don't know what countries have. Right. So, but uh, in terms of, I like what you also said about how most people can get prepared. It, it's well worth within the, the realm of their uh, economic capability to, to get uh, prepared without breaking the bank. Now, when we start getting into the stuff that your company manufactures it is a bit of an investment. So what, where do you think it fits into a person's preparedness plan? Like if you were just starting prepping and you were on a budget, uh, how would you go about it, I guess? And uh, you don't have to give me all the specific details, but where do you think that personal protective equipment, knowing that three seconds without air, where do you think that fits in the hierarchy? And are there any more like, cost-effective options that a person could use, you know, before having to invest hundreds of dollars into, uh, you know, the professional grade equipment that you guys sell? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, as far as kind of the, the beginner stuff, um, you know, food, water, shelter, uh, in case of a nuclear scenario, it's time, distance, and shielding, which is going to uh, protect you from any type of nuclear fallout situation. And really, you know, as far as personal protective equipment specifically, uh, you want to invest in a respirator. Now, it doesn't have to be a seaburn respirator. Uh, you know, it, it would help to have a seaburn respirator in case the threat isn't nuclear, but it is some kind of chemical attack where and it requires seaburn filters. I just want to um, interrupt you there, Roman. Mm -hmm. Can you tell people who aren't mm -hmm. familiar with what you're talking about, a seaburn filter, what that means? So CBRN 
or professionally known as CBURN in you know professional circles is chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear. So when it comes to choosing a CBURN filter, you're going to see that a CBURN filter really consists of two parts. Um, it's a P3 layer, which is a particle filtration layer, along with activated carbon. So what differentiates one filter from another that's a, you know, a, a, a combined filter is the type of activated carbon that's in it. And within this activated carbon, it's impregnated with metal halides, which are metal salts essentially, that are impregnated into the carbon that capture these contaminants as they move through the media. Okay, so what differentiates a higher end, let's say NBC 77 SOF filter, you know, something we sell, and then you know, an ABEC, a standard ABEC filter rated for A2, B2, E2, K2, P3, uh, would be the type of activated carbon, the chemical treatment used, and the metal halides. So th that's, that's the main differentiating factor. I do highly suggest if you do get a respirator to get one that's at least 40 millimeter NATO threaded um, because uh, that's gonna be a, a ubiquitous filter on the market. You're gonna see many 40 millimeter NATO threaded cans in the market. Uh, and that kind of future proofs your, your preps in a way. Um, the only difference really between a C-burn respirator, not the filter, but just the respirator or non-C-burn is a type of rubber it's made out of. And uh, for a C-burn respirator, it's made out of butyl rubber or rubber that's resistant to uh, uh, must, uh, uh, blistering agents because blistering agents, when they come in contact with certain rubbers, will deform the rubber, will, you know, will break through it much, much faster. So for C-burn mass specifically, they use rubbers that are resistant to blistering agents. Outside of blistering agents, um, really uh, other, other C-burn agents, the, the rubber doesn't matter as much because it's only the blister agents which have such an effect on the mask. And that's why it's always the standard use. Um, uh, mustard uh, drops are always the standard use for testing the breakthrough times of C-burn respirators. All of the research is done around blister agents. Okay. Yeah. That's really good to know. Um, because yeah, a lot of people, you know, are going to want to know like what sort of mask can I have that's going to be able to do everything. Now, is there a high likelihood that a person is going to encounter mustard gas? Is it, is it worth it taking that next step and ensuring that you have a CBRN mask, like to get the butyl rubber, would you say? Uh, well, if you're preparing for C burn threats, then you should get C burn equipment. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a student of history and mustard gas has been deployed on the battlefield a hundred years ago, you know, and there's still countries that stockpile this stuff and, and have it on hand, ready to use in case of emergency. Um, how much of it they have, who has it? I don't know. You know, our, our, our most countries going to come out and say, yeah, yeah, we're storing a whole bunch of nerve agents and uh, you know, mustard gas in, in our, in our stockpiles. Here, just in know. Case. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You'll, you'll know once you see that big uh, yellow cloud come over your city, that's when you'll know that there's something, oh, man. Uh, something's on the horizon, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's, it, you know, once again, just be a student of history, right. And, and set trends for the future. It's happened in the past and history tends to repeat itself. Can it happen in the future? Absolutely it can. Will it? I don't know. I hope not, <laughs> you know, but I, I'm always in uh, preparedness mode so that it does happen. You know, I have the basic necessities to get through the storm. And uh, if I have to evacuate, then I'm evacuating with the right equipment so that I could survive the evacuation, right? The hard part is kind of the evacuation. You're leaving your home for another place. And that's really what a bug out bag is for in a way, right? It's, it's just an evacuation kit. I, 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 would, I would actually like to rephrase it and call it a refugee kit in a way, because it's literally you becoming a refugee and you're taking a bag full of everything. Your life basically is in that bag and you're leaving your home behind. And when you take that bag and leave, you should think that I'm not going to return home. That's how you should pack a bug out bag. This is everything I have. I'm leaving and I might not be able to return home ever. And, you know, we've been fortunate in the United States to never have to become refugees in a massive way, 
right? It, it has happened in localized ways where it's a hurricane coming, you evacuate for a short period of time, you can always come back, you know, and, and hopefully your belongings are, are still safe. Sometimes they're not. Uh, but we haven't had to do uh, that as a city or as a state as a whole to evacuate and not be able to come back ever, right? And, you know, we're fortunate in the United States. You're fortunate in Canada. Uh, in parts of the Middle East, you know, that's a different story there because there are many cases where they've literally had to grab a bag of their stuff and get out and go somewhere else and they never came back. They just literally left everything behind because that place is no longer safe to live because it's being inhabited by, you know, terrorists, ISIS, whatever the threat is, mm -hmm. civil unrest. Um, so, you know, think of that. That's the kind of mindset, the kind of hat you should wear when you determine how to prepare. What if I become a refugee? What if I, I can never come home again? What am I going to bring? Right. And that's how you should base your preps around that, I think. I, mean, I think you just gave awesome. me uh, I think you just gave me a video idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure I uh, I'll reference you in the in the credits. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, on a more serious note, I mean, we are seeing a, a situation developing now between you know east in Eastern Europe where you could potentially have another refugee crisis. And uh, a lot of people, I know I have listeners from that part of the world. Um, so this is definitely something that I think, it, especially when you're that close to the front lines that you should have a contingency plan for. And I really like the idea of framing it as a refugee bag, because so often we have this fantasy that we're going to go out into some post-apocalyptic wasteland and, you know, but the reality is, is parts of society are still going to be functioning and you're going to have to find a way to navigate that. And so, you know, making sure above and beyond just your basic provisions that you you have all your documents, you know, that you have all your uh, medications and even a, a means of bartering, you know, if, if it comes to that, you know, because countries, currencies might be devalued at that point or whatever the case might be. So I really like how you framed it there as a, as a refugee bag. So I'm going to have to steal your idea, unfortunately, and <laughs> hopefully, uh, Steal away. make a video and and i'll make sure i pitch rome uh mirror safety products in the uh, uh I, I appreciate that steal away no worries glad, glad to give you ideas <laughs> but uh so i, I want to know like in terms of filters and you talked a bit about cbrn can you explain to people because i know there's a lot of people who don't know i mean you have a vast amount of knowledge of this because this is what you think about all the time but in terms of for preparing for a nuclear threat, we'll say we're not going to talk about dust storms, fires, uh, you know, riot, tear gas, pandemics. We know the gas masks are good for all of those reasons or, or respirators. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to prepping for the nuclear and the radiological, what sort of setup does a person need? Let's say, let, let's put a person uh, on the outskirts of a nuclear blast, say, and there's fallout right. coming. What sort of personal protective equipment would I need in order to survive that if I found myself having to go outside away from my shelter? So uh, for nuclear specifically, you're going to want a multi-gas filter. I think one of the most important things is to have a respirator uh, because a respirator, if you breathe in, uh, particles which are emitting alpha, beta, or gamma radiation, the chances of you developing cancer either in the near term or the long term is very high. So you don't want to breathe that stuff in, right? Um, as far as alpha radiation goes, a piece of paper could stop alpha radiation. So, uh, you know, do you want it on your skin? I personally don't, even though, you know, nuclear physicists will tell you that you know, it won't go through your skin. I don't want it on my skin. So I want to wear a hazmat suit. Um, you know, but the most important thing is, you know, the shielding aspect of it and not breathing it in. As long as you can not breathe in radioactive particulates and then shield yourself from fallout because fallout uh, doesn't have a very long shelf life, right? I, I think the, uh, the stat was within the first hour 
it decreases by uh, a certain percentage that's above 50. And then within one day, it decreases by 80%, the energy emitted by it. So if you could just hunker down for one day from the event um, to when fallout started coming over you, uh, the chances of you know you getting damaged, your body getting damaged by the fallout decreases significantly. Um, and at that point, you know, will a hazmat suit help you? Um, it has limited use in a, in a, in a fallout scenario because when a fallout scenario, you're really going to want to go into a deep interior of a building to increase that shielding as many layers of concrete deep underground. That's going to do way more good for you than a hazmat suit. At that point, a hazmat suit isn't really necessary. And that's going to shield you from the gamma radiation and the beta particles. No, so so uh, gamma. The only thing that could stop gamma is layers of concrete. So right. there's no hazmat suit on the market that could stop gamma radiation. Yeah, that's what if I mean. Like the building is falling on you, yeah. and it, it's emitting gamma radiation. Yeah, um, it, it's going to be bad news. You really yeah. want as much distance and shielding from it and time as possible. And that's the good thing about gamma saying, radiation you is retreat into a a bunker or a basement that has ample amounts of concrete or earth between you and the radioactive event. Right, right. Yeah. So, so one of the safest place to go uh, for an average person would be into a deep interior of a high rise building because there's many layers of walls. There's many layers of concrete. Uh, if it's at, you know, a, a lower level, then hopefully the, the concrete from the foundation reaches up higher and surrounds you there as well you're going to be safer in a high rise than you would you know let's say living in a suburb of a major city and just being in your house because just sitting in your house you're going to have fallout you know falling all over you let's say all over your house and um, you're not going to have as many layers of concrete and um, you know drywall and metals and you know, sheetrock, whatever is in between you. You're not, you're just not going to have as many layers as you would in the interior of a high rise building. So in some ways, those who have access to a, a high rise building in case of a nuclear uh, event uh, are better off than those just hunkering down in their homes. Unless of course their homes are special and they have bunkers or uh, a yeah. basement, you know, that that's set up and surrounded by dirt. Yeah. So it, let's say you're, you find yourself in one of these one-off low probability events. Hopefully it never happens. You find yourself outside. A blast has occurred. Um, you happen to have uh, like what, what sort of uh, protective equipment would be beneficial in the case of you having to, you know, a very short window of time to get to a, a fallout shelter, if you will. Right. So, uh, having, so you're saying, uh, an event goes off and you're not at a shelter, but you have to like kind of whatever's on you right there. And then if you could have something in a go bag or an EDC. Yeah, kit. exactly. Yeah. Like if, if, if you're in your car and an EMP fries your, you know, from the blast fries your car and you're, you know, you got to move, right. What sort of stuff would be beneficial in that particular situation? So the two biggest things I would say is one, having a radio, a crank radio. So that way it doesn't run out of batteries because if that happens, communications could go down, cell towers could go down and the information coming from that radio could be the difference between life and death because it's going to tell you what happened, where it's safe to go to, where it's not safe to go to what the path of the fallout is, you're going to get a lot of information from that radio. Uh, so that I would say is the most important, the top priority is to have a crank radio as part of your EDC. I have it in my go bag. I have it in my cars. Always carry a crank radio because you never know when comms go down. Uh, second most important thing is if there is an event where fallout is coming over you, uh, you don't want to breathe it in. So you want some sort of a respirator it doesn't have to be a sea burn respirator. Really, you're trying to ensure that you're not breathing in the particulates. So any particulate respirator would do a P100 filter that gives you a nice tight seal. 
You also don't want to get particulates into your eyes. Yeah, so you're going to want a set of goggles. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so you're going to want a set of goggles uh, or even better, uh, if you can get a full face respirator that covers your eyes and your breathing orifices, uh, you're going to be in a really good position to at least not breathe the stuff in. If you get fallout on your body and skin, once you get inside, it's very important to remove those clothes, to discard them, put them as far away from other people as possible. If you guys ever watched the show Chernobyl, when the firefighters came into the hospital, the first thing they do is made them strip naked because all of their clothes were covered in uh, radioactive materials that were emitting uh, ionizing radiation. So they made them strip down. After that, you want to take a shower. You want to wash off anything that's remaining on your skin. Uh, because once again, those particulates are emitting energy constantly. Yeah. So just having those particulates close to you is harmful. Um, so yeah, so take a shower, get rid of the clothes, isolate the clothes, move them as far away from living beings as possible. Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, there's a whole process to this and we talked a bit beforehand, uh, earlier in our email exchanges about the importance of having, you know, things like decontamination areas and ways that, you know, knowing how to use all of the equipment, right? Because there is definitely uh, a process to this and it's not enough, I think, to just buy the equipment and store it away. It, it's good that you play around, play around with it. I mean, I'm fortunate. I've, I've used this on multiple occasions uh, just for not only obviously for videos that I've made, but just for things that I do around the house, you know, if there, if I'm in a dusty environment or if I'm testing out a, you know, a, a product or if I'm spraying like insecticide or something like that, uh, they're very useful just to have around, but it's very good to get familiar with the process. And so kind of going back to that, that uh, scenario that we've painted here, um, in addition to the gas mask, just making sure that you were covered to prevent the ingestion or, or contact with any alpha beta particles and trying to get to a, a safe place. And this is something which I think people would have to have a plan beforehand as to where I'm going to go if all hell breaks loose. Like I say, hopefully it never happens, but it might, right? So in terms of the filters, uh, you talked about the P100. So this is a P100 filter. And uh, this, this one little filter is actually, it can do a lot, right? Like, I mean, compared to uh, some of the more expensive filters, like what, you know, I don't have one here. Maybe you have one there, but uh, sure. what uh, can this filter not do that other filters can do? Because I know there's going to be some people who are very confused. There's people who don't know anything about what we're talking about right now. So if you could explain it to like a five-year-old kid, uh, how would you explain the difference between these filters? Sure. So a P100 filter is meant to filter out close to 100% of particulates. So it's like 99.99995% of particulates it's meant to filter out. Uh, so in a scenario such as the one you painted, um, you know, one of the big threats is radioactive particulates, which is literally dust and sand particles that are emitting uh, ionizing radiation because they have come in contact with, you know, the, 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 the uh, remainders of what happens when uh, nuclear fission happens. They come in contact with them. They become irradiated. They start emitting these uh, particulates. You're not going to, you're going to want to block those particulates from getting into your lungs. Um, so this is a particular filter. This will stop particulates from coming into your lungs. So long as you have a good seal around the face and um, you have, you have a filter like this, the difference between this and this, which is, you know, this is a activated carbon filter. This is just a particulate filter. The activated carbon filter also works on gases. Okay, so uh, not per, uh, gases require activated carbon in order to capture them out of the air as you breathe the air. Um, so a multi-gas filter uh, is, is a really good idea for uh, a nuclear scenario because things are gonna be burning around you and you don't know what is burning. You don't know what type of uh, chemicals are burning. So you really don't know 
which filter to use. So the best thing to do is to get a filter which does a wide variety of gases, uh, a multi-gas filter. So, you know, in the professional world, uh, you know, let's say I was working at some kind of chemical plant, I can get a filter that's, you know, a, a, a single gas filter. Let's say it's an uh, organic gas filter with a P3 layer built in. Um, I can get just a single filter uh, uh, that has limited use because I know exactly what threat I'm walking into. Okay. The difference in an emergency event is you don't know what the threat is. So considering you don't know what the threat is, you want to get a filter that does as many things as possible because it, it's unclear what the threat is. Yeah. So yeah, where a P3 filter will offer a, a protection from a variety of situations, whether that's, um, you know, smoke inhalation, uh, biological contaminants, a fire, you know, uh, dust storms, maybe even uh, tear gas. It's not, you never, like you're saying, if there is a conflagration, you don't know what sort of toxic fumes are being emitted from that. So to have the, the carbon in there, to activate a carbon to absorb the, uh, those toxins is, I mean, if you can afford it, I guess, you know, get one of those. That, that, that's, that would be my recommendation. But the P3. Yeah, so, so with a, with a multi-gas filter like this, you're going to want to look at the rating. And okay. for the NBC 77 SOF, it's uh, A2, B2, E2, K2, HG, P3, DR, SX, DIN reactor P3. So the rule of thumb is the more letters and numbers on a European rated filter such as this that you have, the better it is for preparedness because that's telling you that this filter was specifically formulated and tested and certified to filter a wide variety of different types of contaminants. Okay, the letter here, like let's say A is organic gases and vapors, uh, that stands for the type of contaminant. The number next to it stands for the filtration class. It could be either class one, class two, or class three. Class one is rated for 1,000 parts per million. Class two is rated for 5,000 parts per million. And class three is rated for 10,000 parts per million. Mm. Uh, so uh, most filters that are going to be used on air purifying respirators that are going to be attached to the face are going to be class two or class one filters uh, because class three filters are gigantic. If you've ever seen the old Russian, you know, yeah, looks yeah. like a, a soda bottle filter, uh, that's a class three filter. That's meant to filter out way more, uh, but at the same time, it, you know, comes at the expense of being heavy and cumbersome. Something like that, you'd have to wear, you know, a tube connected to your mask connected to a filter that's being held around the pouch on your neck or something like that. It's impractical to put on uh, a standard respirator. So well, any filter that you see that's on the face would either be a class one or a class two filter. That's really, really good information. And so what are some accessories that make using these more <laughs> easier? Because I did a video, I don't know if you remember, uh, probably about three years ago now before the, the shizzy hit the fizzy, where I was uh, doing a little test of how long I could run with a gas mask. And mm -hmm. it's not easy. And I would encourage people, if you have a gas mask or a, a respirator, that you try it out. Because in an emergency situation, chances are you're going to be doing something physical. You might have to haul somebody out. You might have to uh, get out of Dodge quickly you know it might just be an intense situation your heart's racing so your breathing is not as efficient so is there any things that can help out with that like accessories to, to make it more user friendly yes absolutely so uh for that there's there's two options uh one option is a scuba tank called an scba uh that stands for self-contained breathing apparatus uh, that, that is used in professional circles for, uh, especially when you don't know what the threat is. That's going to be the safest way. You're literally bringing your oxygen. It's no longer purifying the air. It is giving you air from a source that's been bottled beforehand, right? So that's really when it comes to any type of emergency scenario, 
the best possible thing you could ever have in it is an SCBA. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they're prohibitively expensive and they take some, uh, you know, they take a lot of knowledge to learn how to use. And uh, there's a lot, you know, the, the, the SCBA tank doesn't last for that long. You, you know, you can't just like easily pop it off and pop on another SCBA tank. Uh, in professional circles, they usually leave the contaminated area uh, uh, in order to swap swap a tank. Um, so that's that's one option, and that is definitely the best option, although not very practical for most people. Uh, the other option is to use what's called a PAPR system or a powered air purifying respirator, and this essentially works as a blower. So I have one right here with two NBC seventy seven uh, SOF filters attached. And literally just an on off switch here that blows a constant flow of 90 liters per minute into your mask. So that way you're, you don't have, you're not exerting yourself to breathe in through a filter media, such as uh, a Seaburn filter. It's doing that for you and putting your mask under positive pressure. Mm. So aside from the uh, ease of breathing, which is a benefit of a, of, of a powered air purifying respirator. There's also the benefit of making the system more foolproof that if let's say you break your seal temporarily, or you have a little bit of extra stubble that can create a seal break, uh, you know, the positive pressure within the mask is constantly flowing air outward. So if you do get a seal break, it's gonna force that air to come out as opposed to come make its way inside of your mask. Hmm. So it, it is, uh, uh, it does help with safety as well, aside from just being easier to use because it's breathing for you. And what is that powered by? Uh, so this one here uh, is powered by eight AA batteries. Uh, on the market, devices like this, I mean, our, ours goes for around $400 but usually they uh, go to like fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500. Uh, we made it really cost effective uh, and it's powered by double, uh, AA batteries, eight of them for up to eight hours of runtime. Uh, most devices like this are powered by lithium sulfide batteries, uh, which are uh, prohibitively expensive. I believe they're like 150 to $200 and uh, they uh, uh, are not rechargeable. Uh, or at least I haven't seen rechargeable versions of it on the market. So it's literally a use it, discard it, you know, another, you know, on your next mission, you open up a new battery and, and do it all over again. With this one, I actually have uh, rechargeable double A's in it. Uh, so that way, once it's used, you could recharge it and it costs you literally nothing to use it. And I would imagine that the, the weight of having to carry something like that would be made up for in the ease of respiration because I know <laughs> having done that test that it becomes very hard to breathe, especially if you're just carrying a little bit of gear. So that can basically balance out that part of the equation. And uh, I think it's definitely something that I'm willing to consider. Um, what about other accessories considerations? I mean, I get a lot of questions about, uh, you know, can a person, you know, hear in terms of communication? So like speech diaphragms, um, prescription eyewear, um, you know, water drinking devices, stuff like that. Maybe you can uh, just talk about some considerations that people are going to have to make because not everybody is the same. Not everybody has the same set of needs. So what do you think about that? Sure. So uh, you're definitely not going to want to remove your gas mask in a contaminated environment. And especially if you're using it in standard APR mode, which is just having a filter can on the side, uh, you know, it's going to get hot. It's going to get, uh, you're going to be exerting yourself. You're going to get really thirsty. Uh, so a drinking system helps considerably uh, with these types of drinking systems that come on most masks, our mask has a drinking system as well. You're going to have to connect it to a uh, drinking port here and then flip it upside down in order to drink. Um, so that uh, is good in a pinch, but not recommended uh, as the best possible way to do it because 
Uh, our mask is also actually compatible uh, with Camelback bladders with a type M adapter. So you put the adapter on here, you connect it to a Camelback bladder, and that way you're always connected to a hydration source. All you have to do is flip this little switch here, put the straw into your mouth and start drinking. When you're done, you just flip it back and you're good to go. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, for anybody who's ever worn a respirator for an extended period of time, especially while exerting themselves, you're going to know it gets really hot. And, uh, you know, having a, a canteen, uh, having, having a way to drink with it is, is I think, vital. Another accessory uh, which you should look into and make sure that your mask is compatible with if you have vision problems is a spectacle kit uh, such as this one here. Uh, so glasses are not compatible with gas masks because if you wear glasses, it's going to break the seal. They, yeah, they the go arm. by the temples. Yeah. Right. Metal arm. Some people create stubby versions of glasses, um, but there's also a problem there because if it's not tight inside of the mask in a secure way, and let's say you're running, gunning, bouncing around, uh, and it becomes loose and just shaking around in there, it's going to be almost impossible for you to put it in a position yeah. where you could see once again. And if you're, you know, very impaired in terms of vision, then that could really make it difficult for you to get to safety, to defend yourself, to have situational awareness and, and understand what's going on around you. So if you are vision impaired, uh, having a gas mask, which is compatible uh, with glasses or, or a spectacle kit like this is, is, crucial in my opinion. Um, another consideration is uh, tear-offs. So not many gas masks have this. Actually, we're, I think we're the only ones that I know of personally, uh, but uh, this tear-off system here, if you get your visor dirty and you're you know, evacuating, um, your option is to try to clean it with your glove, but if it's viscous enough, it's just gonna stain it and then uh, make it very difficult for you to see. With a system like this, you literally could just tear off the outer layer and you're back in the fight. You're, you huh. no longer have a stain visor. And we actually took inspiration from the dirt bike world for this. And um, uh, there's, there's a few of our uh, agency clients, uh, some police departments that uh, kind of asked us about something like this because they always have the fear of like getting milkshaked or something when they're doing riot duty, uh, which has happened quite a few times where they're you know, doing their jobs and somebody throws a milkshake at their face and there's tear gas being deployed. Good luck trying to remove milkshake from your visor, you know, we're just smearing it. You know, the only other option is take off your mask and start wiping it down, but taking off your mask may not be an option if the air is dangerous to breathe. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So th those, those are the, the, the major accessories. Uh, another another thing that should really come standard on most gas masks, it comes standard on some, not on others, uh, is a speech diaphragm. Uh, so this is basically a, a thin uh, 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 piece of material in between your mouth and the uh, 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 front of the mask here, which is embedded inside of here, and it's protected by this, uh, uh, this grid. Uh, it, it vibrates and allows you to hear what's being said. Because if you ever wear a respirator, you're trying to talk to somebody, your voice is going to come out muffled. Uh, so with a mask like this, uh, it provides up to 95% intelligibility of talk, which is basically how intelligible is what you're saying. And that's, uh, that can be very important if you're in a team of people and you're trying to yell at somebody like, hey, you know, don't go there or something. I mean, that little uh, detail could be uh, life-saving. So it's definitely important, I think, to make sure you have a speech diaphragm on your, on your gas mask. Now, what about firearms? Uh, in terms of cheeking up to a mask, uh, one thing I really like about your mask is that it's that full visor, you know, mm -hmm. and it's uh, there. We do sell a couple other masks at CanadianPreparedness.com that are comparable in quality. But I do think that yours has the one of the best visors. And I think that's part of the reason why they used it in the movie Tenet, correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't the movie, right? Yeah. So uh, in terms of if a person was obviously wanting to 
uh, use a firearm with their gas mask, what, what things and what masks do you think would be ideally suited to that purpose? So uh, a gas mask like this could be used with firearms, but it's not ideal for use with firearms considering the shape of the visor. Uh, now in Tenet, it's just a movie. There's like 300 people wearing this mask, shooting at each other. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, tactically that wouldn't be ideal because of the setup they had. Uh, so what is an ideal setup? If you're set on using a mask with a wide panoramic visor, what would the ideal setup look like? Uh, so the ideal setup would be a red dot on a riser, such as a unity mount, and then a gas mask stock. So Zig Zauer makes this stock that you can use on uh, MPXs and MCXs, which curves down. I don't have one here to show, uh, but essentially it's a stock that attaches, comes down at an angle, and then comes up, right? So that way you can get really in there and you yeah. can get directly in front of your, uh, of your, of your firearm. And, um, the, uh, and you don't need a good cheek weld because the optic is high above the weapon. So with that combination, uh, with this mask, it's a breeze. Now, if you want you know, standard weapon systems and standard rifles, I would suggest a mask such as this, uh, this is the CM7M gas mask. This is a product that's being actively used by some military forces uh, uh, in the world. And with, with something like this, what you're getting is a tapered cheek profile here. So uh, this allows you to get closer to the stock of a firearm. And then the recessed optics, they allow you to get closer to an optic to get eye relief. Okay, if you ever use binoculars, if you're not at a certain distance away, you're not going to be able to see through them because you're not getting eye relief. They're made really for a certain distance away. So this gives you that flexibility to bring that optic much closer to your eye. Also, another tactical consideration, uh, and uh, you know, this is really popular now, is night vision. Uh, night vision has come down in price quite a bit, and with most gas masks that have a spherical type of visor like this, it's going to be almost impossible to use night vision. So if you're going to use night vision, uh, you're going to want a recessed close to the face visor system um, that's compatible specifically with night vision. Uh, and this mask was actually designed with uh, night vision in mind. So it is compatible. And is there any newer uh, or other products that you guys must sell along the lines of personal protective equipment? I should add, uh, one thing we forgot to mention with respect to preparing for nuclear fallout was potassium iodide tablets. I know you guys sell those at your website. And basically, if anybody doesn't know it, it prevents uh, uptake of uh, radiation in the thyroid. So mm -hmm. that would definitely be something, a cost-effective solution, I guess, if you were trying to build a nuclear kit, if you will. Um, but is there any other products that you guys have on the horizon or things that you're working on that you want to talk about? Sure. So uh, we have a mop suit coming out, um, which I could show you over here. Oh, cool. Uh, so this is a standard hazmat suit. I think you did a video on this. It's called the yes, has suit. Has right? suit. Um, I call it so, the sweatsuit. <laughs> right. The sweatsuit. Yeah. Great and for working out. <laughs> That, yeah, so that's something uh, that's very important that you just said there, the sweatsuit. And it really is a sweatsuit. It's oh, yeah. meant to keep out as much stuff as possible, right? So it's not breathable. And that's one of the limitations to a, a suit like this. Uh, especially on a hot summer day, you can't use it for a very long period of time. It's really meant for get up and get out as fast as possible. It's not I'm hunkering down in this place wearing the suit for an extended period of time because you're going to lose a lot of water, okay? Especially if you don't have a hydration system. Right. Uh, and you In the military, they actually have a matrix chart which goes into how much time you have depending on what mop level you're currently wearing and how much fluid intake you should be taking. So it, it's a very kind of, you know, scientific kind of breakdown on it. Which and it's important to know really how much time you should be spending in a device like this. So um, great for uh, preparedness, uh, low cost option, but it's a sweatsuit. So the other option is a permeable hazmat suit. 
So this is our permeable hazmat suit here. It hasn't released yet. Uh, so this is, you know, it looks like a military jumpsuit, uh, but what makes it unique is all American lined. prepper, all, all American prepper is going to love this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's lined with activated carbon. So it okay. basically acts as a full body filter. Hmm. So it also works for gases and vapors, considering it's lined with activated carbon. So, you know, basically think of it as a passive filtration system for your entire body that when, let's say, a nerve agent hits this fabric, instead of making its way onto your skin, uh, it gets absorbed by the suit. Uh, and the beauty of this is it's also washable up to 50 times without losing any of its protective properties. Wow. Uh, you know, after you dry it though, it is required to put it in a, a vacuum seal. It doesn't have to be a tight, tight vacuum seal, uh, but it, it does have to prevent airflow coming in and out of it because uh, all filters, including a filter like this, yeah. passively absorbs uh, contaminants. So if you pop open a filter or a suit like this that's uh, lined with activated carbon uh, and you, you're not breathing through it or actively using it, it's still absorbing contaminants in the air constantly. You may not see them, but there's contaminants all over the place. So that's why they say you should vacuum seal your filters. You should, you know, buy them vacuum sealed and keep them vacuum sealed. Uh, it's very important to prevent passive absorption of contaminants. Uh, so yeah, something something like this. Uh, we're really kind of aiming for the military market with this. Uh, but one of the Mira safety credos is, you know, whatever we provide to the military, we also want to provide for regular civilian use. Uh, and unfortunately, within this space, even though there's no laws against owning, uh, you know, a, a permeable military mop suit, uh, most companies that are in the space do not sell to civilians or they flat out refuse and ask you for credentials when you go to buy things like this. Uh, you know, we believe that anything the pros have, the regular Joes should have as well. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're very proud of that. And that's kind of one of our fundamental principles uh, here at Mirror Safety. Yeah, and I think that's why your company has been so successful in the last two years is, I mean, I know just in the, the YouTube space, pretty much all the major YouTube channels are donning your stuff now, everyone from Colio Noir, Demolition Ranch, um, it, pretty much every prepping channel out there. And I think it has a lot to do with that catering to the civilian market, because I know 10 years ago, I mean, the best thing you could really get that was really accessible, at least, you know, from my perspective up here in Canada was like one of those old, uh, you know, used uh, army surplus gas masks that you didn't even know if it was going to work, <laughs> you know, when you, when you uh, had to go and use it. So I think it, it's great that you're giving people more options and not making this exclusively for government agencies, even though you do work with those agencies and have contracts, because it's important that especially this day and age with all of the threats. And I always say like, we're living in the age of consequences, you know, and every other month, it seems that another threat is presenting itself in which having personal protective equipment is going to be an asset. I made a, a facetious joke probably midway through 2020 that we had already basically had every reason to, to use a gas mask. We had wildfires, we had riots, we had a pandemic. We even had a nuclear scare with uh, people probably don't even remember, but the whole Ir Iranian uh, commander who was killed and you know people were worried about you know whether that was going to set off world war three so i mean in my personal opinion if a person is just starting to prep i wouldn't say go run out and spend hundreds of dollars on personal protective equipment but i would say that you know once you have your your food your water your plan your bug out bag or your <clears throat> refugee bag and your medical supplies squared away, then it's time to start looking into that iconic gas mask. Because as, as maybe 
sensationalized as it's been in, in, in Hollywood and even in the prepping community, I mean, it really is the icon of the, the, the prepper world. You know, whenever you see prepper, you think of a guy in a gas mask, uh, whether or not your logo is a gas mask, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's recognizable, right? It's universally recognizable as the prepping icon, but is it something that you're going to use 99% of the time? The fact is no. But like I said, when we started this conversation, if you need it, you really, really need it. It's just like a winch on a truck. You know, you're probably never going to use it for 99% of the time, but when you need it, boy, do you ever really need it. So, right. you know, that's all I would really say to, to people who are kind of on the fence about it. I would say, make sure that you, you have all those other bases covered first and don't break the bank for this stuff. But if you're a person who's been doing this for a while and you have all those bases covered, then it's certainly something you might want to consider, especially nowadays. And it really, in my opinion, depends on where you live. Like if I was in Eastern Europe right now, I would absolutely want some sort of respirator. You know, oh, yeah. if I lived in wildfire country, or even if I worked in a high rise building and I was worried about uh, fires breaking out, you know, having a, a gas mask just makes perfect sense. Uh, speaking of which, I wanted to ask you about something else. What are, what are your uh, thoughts on smoke hoods? And is that something you've ever considered for the company in terms of offering people? Sure. So smoke hoods are basically uh, very simple catalytic converters that go on your face that convert carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide, allowing you to breathe it out. They use an oxidizing agent called hopcolite most of the time. That's one of the agents used. Uh, so uh, I think they're great for fire escape. Uh, however, um, when I shop for things and when I build my personal kits, I always think of covering as many bases as possible and not having to have two different devices that are similar, yeah, right? And one can kind of do it all and one can do some of it. So uh, we actually have a filter called the VK450. Uh, so this filter here is a Seaburn filter that also has Hopcolite in it. So for a period of up to 15 minutes, that's what it's rated for. That's the international basically standard for smoke escape hoods and smoke escape filters. Uh, this device, uh, this, this filter will convert carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide allowing you to breathe it out at uh, 5,000 parts per million it's rated for. Uh, so that's 0.5% of volume uh, for escape and evasion pur purposes only. You never want to wear a smoke hood or something like this uh, attached to a full face respirator, you know, to go into a burning building or, um, you know, to, to, do, to, to stay in an environment for an extended period of time waiting for help. It's all about escape and evasion as fast as humanly possible. So, um, you know, once again, when it comes to uh, preparedness, I like to get a one and done kind of thing that works with many different types of threats. So instead of a smoke escape hood, you could purchase a full face respirator with a, uh, a filter cartridge that's meant for a plethora of threats. And that combination works very similarly to a smoke escape hood. Mm -hmm. The only difference would be the escape hood um, it's really just meant for the carbon. Well, this is made for carbon plus the other gases that are released because you have to realize in a fire, it's not going to be just carbon monoxide that could kill you. It's going to be that burning television set. It's going to be, you know, that, that bedding that's made of nylon. It's going to be those chemicals that are in your bathroom that are getting burned up underneath your sink. Uh, all those things combined can lead to you know a lethal concoction of other things aside from carbon monoxide that could harm you. Right. Um, this is made out of rubber, however. Most of those escape hoods are made out of like aluminum. Um, so heat resistance, obviously aluminum is going to be a little better. You don't want to be uh, you know in a fire and and really get too close to the fire with a, a you know, this is plastic and rubber mostly. Okay. So that's, that's the only, I would say, drawback, right? But in most cases, you're not going to be getting close enough to the fire 
uh, for that to matter and for a long, you know, for an extended period of time. Yeah. Most of it is going to be the fires around me. I'm not too close to it and I'm getting out as fast as humanly possible. And this, uh, a device like this would allow me to uh, breathe while I escape because most people in fires don't die from burning to death. They die from the gases, the fumes and the carbon monoxide that's produced. Yeah, I, that's the, the Mac daddy of filters. I, I've talked about that one on the channel before. And if I could only bring a, a few filters, I mean, they definitely, that would be one of them for sure. So yeah, is there any, uh, any other accessories or uh, items that you guys have on the horizon? Yeah, so there's one big product that we have on the horizon, uh, uh, a few, but one that, that I'll talk about for now. It's a dog escape enclosure. Uh, we're calling it the, the first breed collapsible seaburn kennel. Uh, like and, that. Yeah, and, and you know, since I started the company, we've been getting countless messages of people asking, hey, how about my dog? How about my cat? I mean, people love their animals. And uh, to this day, there's been nothing on the market that could uh, help them survive a, a potential scenario where, uh, you know, the air becomes toxic. So uh, this is the device here. I could, I could quickly show it to you. It's, it's kind of big, but it's lightweight. <laughs> oh, wow. So a little exclusive peek there. And uh, once it's ready for prime time, you know, I'd love to send you one to, to check out. I don't know if I could carry Marshall in that though. He's out, he weighs a hundred <laughs> pounds. <laughs> uh, so if he's trained, uh, we're going to be, so initially we're going to be releasing it in this like medium size, yeah. uh, but then we're going to be going larger and smaller as well, depending on the market and depending on, you know, the traction of this product and how many people actually, you know, purchase it. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're looking to kind of develop a line of protective products for animals. And uh, this will work under positive pressure. So it's going to have a blower system built in and uh, it's going to blow 90 liters per minute into the uh, enclosure and basically, you know, keep the animal safe. And uh, it just, it's just going to depend on what kind of filters you put on it as to the filtration level uh, and, and the threat that's present. Wow. So for all you dog and cat lovers out there, there is a solution on the horizon. So just stay tuned for that. Well, hey, man, it's been great uh, having you out here today. And uh, would you be willing to throw my subscribers a little discount code? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we can do uh, Canadian CP10, CP10 for 10% off. All right. Yep. There you or go. go to the Canadian Preparedness website because you have yeah. our products as well on your website. So, check them out on the Canadian Preparedness website. And I would say, you know, if you're in Canada and you wanted to get your gear, go through canadianpreparedness.com. You can use the coupon code survival prepper for 10% off. But if you're in the States, it might be more cost effective for you to just go through uh, the actual Mira safety website because your prices, you know, we have to deal with import fees. So if Canadians don't want to have to deal with all that, because when you buy anything from the States, you do have to pay duties and taxes on it. With us, we make sure that we've covered all the duties and stuff already. So, you know, uh, or you could just uh, go wherever you want. You know, you get a coupon code, go wherever <laughs> you're going to get the best deal possible for the stuff. But I want to thank you for coming on. And I look forward to some more of these innovations. And I really like that you're so open to, to having these conversations. There's not a lot of companies whose owner is also, you know, a prepper and is willing to to just engage in conversations like this with the community. And I think that is why you guys are doing so well that you're, you know, you're going to shot show, you're putting yourself out there. You're basically plastered across YouTube. So whatever you're mm -hmm. doing is working. And uh, just, I want to congratulate you on your success and thank you for helping people because what you're doing is potentially saving a lot of lives. And I think that that doesn't get, said enough that uh, in this industry, you know, you're, you're potentially saving a lot of lives and we should never really lose sight of that. So keep up the good work. Thank you, Nate. Really, really appreciate the kind words. Um, love being on your show. If you'd love for like me to come back on and talk about some stuff, I'd love to do it.
Well, maybe next time I'll uh, I'll hit up the All American Prepper and see if he wants to do the <laughs> interviewing, and we'll see what the outcome of that one is. That one might get. Yeah, us we, might, we might have a lot in common with All American Prepper. So, <laughs> the all maybe you could do the All uh, All Russian Prepper, and I'll do the All American Prepper, and we can you know meet in the middle somewhere. Uh, that that might be good. That might be good. <laughs> I hope you're ready for some vodka and AK 47s right? <laughs> hey, yeah, you know that that could work. That could work definitely. All right. Well, thanks a lot, man, and uh, take care. Take care. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye bye. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk, and no gimmicks. Use discount code Prepping Gear for ten percent off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.